and are published, the scientists consider them inferior material. And I kind of support the, support that notion, like they are inferior. And as a scientist, you should avoid them. You shouldn't, if it's possible, you shouldn't cite media. You shouldn't cite um, articles from the media, from blogs, from social media, all those kind of things. So, yeah. And um, I can think I have basically five minutes now, or um, maybe I have more, but I'm just going to kind of rush through those different types of um, secondary research that I talked about. So the difference that like for most scientists or most researchers, young researchers that message me like over the course of three months asking like a question about research, their first question usually is, uh, what's the difference between systematic analysis and Nigerian researchers or you want um, papers published by those that conducted research in Nigeria, or just several criteria like you don't want papers that are non-peer reviewed, something like that. So you bring all those um, papers that fall into your criteria and you make that as your base, like where you are going to draw your conclusion from. So you analyze over the years, you just look at the paper, you read it, there's something called systematic condition of condensation of um, nutrition. Maybe certain papers say the same thing. You keep those paper on one side. Other papers like argue that what this side said is wrong. So you look at the evidence. The one that is very overwhelming, the one that is like um, everybody's saying the, almost the same thing. That's the one you like base your own paper on. Although you're not going to neglect the fact that other people said this, your conclusion is wrong. We are going to explain that over the years, you've seen that more people are able to prove this side of the argument than that side. It's just like you summarizing all the papers that fit into your inclusion criteria. So basically, as like systematic review, you do that. And um, meta-analysis really is that uh, maybe a researcher has data from 50 participants, no, 500 participants in his research, and another person has 250 participants, and you know how the number goes. You add all of those data from all of those different participants, and you have your all big data. So instead of you analyzing just 500 um, participants' data, you're analyzing like thousands. Like you really did not you kind of just did not focus on their conclusion. You are saying, I want your data. Let me analyze it myself. I want data from everybody. So instead of maybe the data you collected that is from the 500 participants is based on the Nigerian situation and another data is based on the USA situation. So when you analyze this data from different countries, you can draw a reasonable conclusion that can apply globally, that can be globally generalized. So that's systematic analysis. It's, you also have to like set inclusion and exclusion criteria. It's just that this time you're neglecting your conclusion and you're just focusing on carrying out those particular um, things. And I also wanted to say that John has really, really like sometimes consider systematic analysis or mental analysis as primary research because they feel like you do a lot of work, you do a lot of mental tasks to get the paper ready. So, um, and one more thing that people ask me about is that, so what's the difference between systematic review slash analysis and normal review? And what's the difference between narrative review and literature review? And what's the difference between narrative review and mini review? So I'm just going to like, explain what the difference is. So I already said what systematic review and analysis is. And narrative review basically is, OK, you don't set, set inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria. You just go to a database and you draw out papers, like maybe PubMed now. You draw out a lot of papers, you read it, and then you use those papers to form your own work. Like you're just summarizing papers, but you're not summarizing in uh, papers that fall into a particular inclusion criteria. It can be papers from 50 years ago, like just random kind of summary, that's what you're giving when you are doing um, narrative review. And mini review is sort of narrative review. It's just that it's not as broad. It's not as wild. So for example, now, um, narrative review can be 5,000 words, but mini review can be 2,000 words. So something like that. And um, there's another thing I think I forgot. Like, so narrative review and mini review are more similar than systematic review and um, 
narrative review. So just to like end, I'm going to say, apart from all these reviews that I've said, there's so many papers you can publish. You can publish editorials, commentary, letter to the editor, um, short communication, briefs, even um, clinical images, you can publish that. So, um, okay, I just kind of saw one question here. That was the difference between systematic review and scoping review. So scoping is really like a buzzword that they use to replace narrative. So it's more of narrative than systematic. That's what I would say. And um, although some journals would say they are different, but if you look at the papers that the term scoping review and once the term narrative review, they are really similar. But then if you have a better like understanding of this, we're all yet to learn, you can always like share. So as I was saying, commentary, um, letters to the editor, all of that, they really just are um, papers that don't either, like they don't fall into, um, narrative review and they don't fall into normal primary research like for example commentaries you see a particular issue in your country and you feel like I should write a piece on this like I should make it scientific it's almost like a media piece but with a lot of scientific evidence that's like a commentary yeah providing your comments like your opinion of some sort that's commentary and letter to the editor is shorter than the commentary it's like maybe 800 words some 500 words some 1000 words and this is like maybe you identify a particular error in a published material and you want to say that or you feel like the entire um, um published material is kind of flawed you want to say that too and um clinical images are like for example a very um rare diseases like rare disease that you found as a clinician you kind of like take an image of that and you publish it because it's like images up with learning as a medical student as um, a resident and all of that so that's what clinical images are um, brief communication is like you are doing a research that is going to be groundbreaking but you've not yet gotten to the end of it yet but you feel very eager to like submit a material that shows the progress of your research that shows like few things you've been able to conclude from the research that's like brief communication at the end of the day you can publish the entire paper but for like um that moment you just don't want the scientific community to be in the dark about what's happening and um Basically, I think I've <laughs> been able to go through all of that. But during the question and answer, you can always like ask me questions and I'll be very willing to like share. All right, thank you everyone for, for listening. And sorry, I'm, I was so fast. Some people might not have followed, but 20 minutes is really like a short time to talk about research. So um, I don't know if I should welcome the second speaker, but I think I should. <laughs> so like I'm opening the um, door, like the, entire session for the second speaker to take. Okay, thank you so much, Esther. That was, that was, that was amazing. Um, so you've heard uh, how research um, endeavors can start. And you've also heard about different um, types of research. And you also heard Esther saying that we, we definitely cannot exhaust um, the process and um, the aspects of research in just the the, the future, uh, the, 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 the the little time we have. So um, that's why we have a series of webinars to supplement whatever um, has been brushed over. Um, and you've had just be keen in your uh, clinical areas, be keen in school, and you never know what you might write up about and what you might even publish, might, which might be different in uh, the scientific realm. So I'll introduce the second speaker. Um, he's called Dr. Brian Gure, and he's a critical care medical officer in Nairobi, Kenya. So he has a background training in human anatomy and is also pursuing a higher education in the same. Um, his research interests include basic sciences, uh, medical education, clinical disciplines such as surgery, um, anesthesia and critical care. And he envisions transitioning from a clinical uh, scientist leveraging on his research um, to now being more um, focused on that aspect. So as much as he may seem superhuman and different, he does uh, usually just enjoy riding his motorcycle when he's not in the hospital. 
Apa uh, anak cuma so kari budak cai. Um, thank you very much. I think we begin by uh, just muting all the all the participants who probably. I'm doing be that. On. I'm working on that. Okay. Okay. Oh. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brian, as, as um, Chana has just um, introduced. Uh, he said many things. <laughs> I think you can tell <laughs> uh, that maybe he's not the one who coined the, the, the introductory statements. Anyway, my name is Brian. I will uh, want to talk to you about um, a few things today. I was um, given an opportunity and um, something that I thought is wise to. And even as we begin, I'll just share my screen so that we we start off together. So give me a minute and uh, I'll get in my pointer in case I need to use it uh, early enough. Um, so I hope I'm audible and that we can proceed. Yes, you're Let's talk. Here. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so my name is Brian. Uh, Brian goes well. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, why we should engage in research and um, touch on how to develop a research question. Um, and I prepared this talk on, I think, on 24th. Um, I have a strong background in teaching. So most of my presentations are usually quite structured. Um, in this presentation, I'll, I'll probably go through a few objectives that I have here. One would be to introduce myself, um, talk about why we wanna do this research thing. Uh, is it important and why should we do it? And then does it help to have research skills as in moving through life, um, especially in the medical field, does it help and does it matter? Uh, and then second, the third thing is, um, I think the, the issue of when to start most of you are probably here. Um, I'm not sure of the entire profile of, of um, the audience, but I would imagine that a large number of you are uh, medical, stu uh, medical students or even graduates of the same. Um, so the big question, the reason you're here is probably because you also need to know whether this is the right time to start for those who have not started and for those who have already started, uh, whether it's, it's worth um, keeping on. The other thing is how to start. So this is where we talk about developing the research question. Uh, I'll share some resources for the same um, and personally my journey as well. Um, action points. Um, I believe um, most of us are here so that we can do something with this presentation or this webinar series. So I'm hoping that at the end we can come up with some action points that we can follow through so that we get some, um, some output. Most of the examples that I'll, I'll use are drawn from my personal experiences. So uh, where they are not clear, or you may not um, come from the cold, same cold sack that I do, I'll be glad to elaborate um, the phrase later on. Um, most of them are also from the African and Kenyan context because I'm Kenyan um, and I'm very happy to be African. Um, the guy you're seeing on the screen, um, I think today I'm in a maroon shirt. Yeah, so that's me, picture of myself there. I am... Um, um, 27 years old. I am a BSc anatomy, human anatomy graduate. I graduated in uh, 2014 and uh, I also went ahead to graduate with my medical degree in 2018. I'm currently doing my master's of science in human anatomy. I'm in part one, hoping to get through um, by maybe in the next one or two months. Um, when I'm, that's my brief background of um, higher education qualifications. Um, right now I work as a critical care medical officer in Nairobi. Uh, my job involves basically working in the ICU, um, seeing patients, uh, intubating them, putting catheters, uh, dialysis or central lines. Uh, that's the kind of work that, that uh, I think uh, puts food on the table for me. Um, on top of that, I also work as an editorial assistant um, for the Annals of African Surgery, which is um, the premier surgical journal uh, in, in Kenya and I think in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it's domiciled by uh, the Surgical Society of Kenya. 
I'm also uh, part of the team that um, runs the Journal of Gynecology and Obstetrics, uh, Eastern Central Africa. Uh, also, this is um, by the Kenya Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. I'm part of a research consortium as well. Um, the goal is usually to just try and put out um, 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 research from time to time. Uh, we always have a number of uh, projects running. Uh, right now we have about five or six. So the goal is usually to try and get as much scientific communication out as possible. Um, I, um, my profile says I am a prolific writer or a distinguished writer. I feel like that's, that's uh, uh, thank you for that. I have a number of publications, I think uh, a little short of 20 in peer reviewed journals. Um, most of them are original articles. Um, recently I picked up on, on what the previous speaker talked about and called um, secondary uh, research. So uh, recently I've been doing a lot of um, systematic reviews and rapid reviews, which I'll share with you. I have attended a number of conferences. Um, I, I don't know, I can't count at this point, but there are quite a number. Uh, locally, um, many of them, a few in South Africa, uh, and and just around and um, even some uh, in the United States. Uh, most of these were just when I was in medical school, uh, given an opportunity to travel or to to present my research work. Um, grants I have um, been a beneficiary of a number of grants when I was in medical school. Um, I think I think four or five travel grants, um, research grants, um, yeah. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I think I'll be able to touch on this. Um, the main goal for me to be able to talk about this today is so that I can share the path that I serendipitously discovered along the way, and I hope that the same path or pointers to the same can be something that's useful to you. Um, so the big question is why research? Um, actually, begs the question: Why are we sitting here? Why are we having um, a talk about this? In fact, I just had a work meeting before this and I had to, to tell Nikita that I may be a few minutes late, luckily I was not. But why do we spend time? Um, it's Friday, I mean, it's about to be close of business. There's so many things you would be doing with your time, but you want to learn more about research. The, the big question is why? Um, Esther talked about um, research being the only um, known scientific currency, and I think she alluded to this. In academia or in science, uh, the only way that anyone ever listens to you uh, being an authority or being anything in contributing anything to a particular subject is through publications. And uh, the hyperlink there guides you to, to, to um, a write-up that I, I, I came across and people debate and discuss this in detail. I think it's something worth looking at. The other thing that uh, makes us do research is that there are some people who deep down inside want to contribute to generating knowledge and they want to be, to, I don't know, create um, some form of knowledge and leave a mark. So if that's what you want to do, then probably research is a thing for you. Um, in any point or at any, uh, any given field, you want to have to be at the apex. You know, if you're in the army, you want to be the army general, the full general. So if, if you want to be in the apex, uh, say your interest is in um, cardiology. So if you're, if you're running drug trials um, in cardiology or you're an infectious disease specialist and you're running drug trials um, on COVID, then you're probably going to be at the apex of your field. So research takes you there. Um, again, exposure and travel, you, you get a chance to, to, to go out and share your, your findings with other people. And then that means you'll have to move from one part of the world to another. So if you wanna travel and you wanna be exposed to more people who think differently, uh, research is a thing for you. Um, money initially doesn't pay off uh, quite well, but uh, over time you realize that uh, research can actually pay and it actually pays well. Uh, uh, I personally uh, benefited a lot when I was in medical school and I was able to do a, gig, a few gigs here and there and they were enabled, enabled me to get some money to, to be okay, you know, uh, medical school life can be tough. So I was even able to buy a few motorcycles and stuff like that. So the money can come in. Um, satisfaction as well. And uh, if you want to progress in academia, then there's no way you're going to do that if, if you don't publish. Um, I'll talk about three things just now. And uh, the first thing is the Annals of African Surgery. Uh, this is an, uh, 
as I said, a journal that, that is domiciled here in this country and basically uh, publishes a lot of scientific work, uh, mainly in surgery. I, I have gotten a chance to, to work for them or be involved in their operations for about, uh, I think, since I was in my second or third year of medical school. Uh, that would be in 2012. Uh, that would be about eight years now. Um, it's, it's a place I've been able to learn a lot uh, in terms of the journey. So sometimes it helps to understand research. It's, it's often, um, the, the, the often talked about path is where you start as the author. But sometimes when you start as the publisher or working for the publisher, you, you tend to learn a lot uh, and it, it guides your, your journey from, from the back going front. So with them, I was able to pick up a lot of uh, the information. One, how to publish. Two, what you can publish. Three, when people, because you, you essentially will be on the back end of this and you'll be reviewing other people's work, all right? So you'll be able to know um, if I was to do something, if I did it like that guy, I'm probably not gonna do well. And this is, this is um, um, a place that I benefited a lot um, over the years and I continue to benefit because I still work uh, there. It's pro bono um, for now, but uh, I think the experience has taught me a lot. The second thing um, is a story I'd like to share um, November of, actually December of 2016, I was, I was a beneficiary of, of a travel grant by the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology to um, Seattle, Washington. And it was part of an elective uh, term. So part of the things that uh, you had to go through to get this elective term in was an interview. And in the interview, exposure to research and um, your research experience came in quite strongly. So I was able to demonstrate that I had started research a while back. I had been able to publish a few articles by then. Then I was a fourth year medical student and, and the panel was quite impressed, they were happy. And what happened is I went for, for the um, elective term in the States and uh, while there I got a call and it was from one of my, uh, the panelists and they introduced me to, to a gentleman. His name, his name is Dr. Joshua Boga an Australian who was working in uh, Geneva. So he was a senior technical uh, WHO officer and uh, his work was basically generating the guidelines that we see, the, the, the guidelines that generally populate the WHO reproductive health library. So there's a lot of data that's churned out out there uh, about use of misoprostol, when, how much should you use or how much should you give, uh, who should get and who shouldn't. And often it's usually independent data by very many um, authors, but now he, the WHO came up with a way where they coalesce all this data from uh, Cochrane reviews and all this, and they come up with, uh, with guidelines. But now the guidelines, uh, coming up with the guidelines is essentially a lot of work. So this, this gentleman, uh, Vogel, was able to recruit me as part of his team. And my work was to come through very many reviews and synthesize data. And I, I am glad to say that in the years between 2016 and 2018, most of, of the guidelines that were uploaded on the WHO Reproductive Health website were um, following my contribution. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is um, um, the research consortiums that, that, that I am currently in. So I, I benefit a lot from spending a lot of time with um, one, like-minded people, two, people who are better than me, and three, people who, who um, have an interest in research. Um, so this is a paper which recently just published. Um, my name is, is, is right here. Um, and, and we published it in uh, the European PMC, right? The Journal of, of Medical Virology. And this is a peer-reviewed journal with a fairly good um, uh, um, rating, if, uh, as it were. Um, and what we basically were looking at was um, at, at work, I was seeing a lot of COVID patients and I figured we, once they test negative, we're releasing them to go back home. But if they go back home, is there a potential um, exposure that could be happening to other loved ones that they have? If you're not shedding the virus with your mouth and with your nose, is it possible that you're shedding, you're shedding your virus um, elsewhere? And, and once we looked at data, so this was a rapid review, uh, so a review of secondary data, and we were able to, to uh, actually pick up that um, for five to 35 days post-testing negative for COVID, 
you'd still be shedding uh, um, virus. And this was published on 13 of May, I think 2020. This was uh, one of my recent publications. Um, so the reason I bring this up is because uh, um, most of this work does not happen single-handedly. So often you will not uh, find yourself being able to, to bite and chew the entire uh, uh, cow as it were by yourself. So you need someone to spearhead, someone to mine the data, someone to write up the manuscript, someone to submit, and then the research consortiums or the partnerships come together. I've spent a lot of my time uh, in the Department of Human Anatomy, the University of Nairobi. There I have met very, uh, most of the people you'll actually see here are, are, are from that department. And they, they, they are a, a young group of, of uh, very vibrant people. So once you, you spend time with people who um, are doing this, then eventually you have no uh, option but, but to pick up on the same. Uh, moving on, I, I'd like to discuss uh, the issue of when to, to, to begin uh, or when to start. I personally, um, I think, started research uh, my first year of medical school. I presented in my first conference, the first, um, first year of medical school. It was a conference in Mombasa. And I remember I did not know how to go or who I would meet. But by, if you ask me, then my answer would be start as soon as you can. If you're in your basic years, then it's a good time to start. If you're in your cl clinical years, uh, that's a good time to start. I've met people who have started research in their residency and it's picked up well for them. I've also met people who um, have started uh, as a specialist. The thing about research is that it's a skill. It's like riding a motorcycle or racing or writing so many of these things and, and it needs uh, a lot of time in, in terms of honing your skills if if i were to be asked uh, my personal opinion uh, the earlier you start the bit, the better the problem is uh, that once you start early often you have many difficulties many challenges money being one of them time being another expertise and knowledge and often people will look at you as as a young person who does not know much um, but this soon changes um, as, as you continue to give your output. The last thing that you want to consider is that maybe research is not for you. If you're going into it for the wrong reasons, then it probably will be more frustrating than beneficial. Um, how to start uh, it? Uh, that's a tough question, honestly. But um, personally, what I did is I identified an area of interest um, or an area I was curious about. And my initial area of interest was anatomy. The reason why it was an area of interest is because I was fairly, I think I was fairly, I, I did fairly well um, in, in the subject. So understanding at the basic level was not quite difficult. So maybe there's that one thing, microbiology, anesthesia, PIDs, uh, something that really interests you. Maybe the, the right thing to start is start by picking on it. Um, second thing is try and protect some time for research. So often people will usually do research as an afterthought. Uh, people will do research once they're done with every other thing, you know. But if you decide that you will have an hour every day or three hours every week that you do only research, then you're likely to, to, to progress. The other thing is it's wise to have a working group or uh, a research consortium, as, as we may call it. And this usually serves as uh, accountability partners. You'll hear a lot of uh, this term uh, in prayer groups, right? So when people uh, tell each other, uh, follow each other, did you read your Bible today? And I think we should be able to do the same for research. Um, if, if you can have a group of people, if, if uh, Chana and Nikki and, um, and Mudoni Muritu and Noela, and I don't know who else I've seen here that I know, and Kyoko come up together and they decide that they'll be meeting every, every week or every two weeks. And I think that's what FreeMed is trying to bring up having some sort of a consortium, then that's the way to push it. Then finally, this, this couldn't be stressed uh, more. Uh, mentorship, if, um, as, as you go through, through um, your medical school life, uh, a few things will, will strike you quite, quite, uh, quite seriously. One is that um, in medical school, everyone will uh, avoid the topic of research, right? Most people don't like it, so they'll avoid it, even your teachers. Secondly, is uh, no formal teaching of research will happen actually. So most people will just uh, imagine that if you learn it, it should be in it, okay? So one second thing is you won't be taught anything about it. Third thing is that despite not being taught 
uh, you won't, most of the medical schools now don't need it to be uh, a qualification for graduation. So you won't need to do any projects. You, you know, you just come out um, as raw as you are. Fourth thing is you realize that um, um, this, this research thing, as much as no one taught you how to do it and no one impressed upon it, the minute you're done, people will grade how good a medical student you are if you've done some research or not. So those who will have done some research and published some papers will probably be, be the hot kick uh, when residency applications come, right? So th there's a, a part here where no one told you about it or no one told you about the importance. And then now there's this part where, oh my God, if you did it, you're the guy. So this is the funny thing about, about um, research and especially in medical school. And what I think that uh, you should do is try and find yourself a, a good and a proper mentor. When you're going through med school, you'll always find these people who um, want to push that agenda. And often they'll ask you to start off by being an assistant. Uh, I still am an assistant to date. Uh, it's just that uh, I think like in the drug dealing business, you just move higher in the ranks as you, as you go through it. So you, you won't be the Sicario on the ground um, in a year or two. Next, you'll be reporting to the boss. And then the year after that, the boss will ask you to have a partnership with him. And I think that's essentially how mentorship works. So when you start off, you probably will be the Sicario on the ground who's you know, uh, doing the groundwork, uh, running around, collecting data from patients, but it's OK because you're in there to learn. The final thing is that um, if you find a way to make research pay you, you're probably likely to stick. So I used to collect data for people and they'd pay me for that. Uh, and I'd still get the publication because for me, that was the most important part. Um, I also applied for grants. That meant I got some money to run the research that I did. That meant I had some, some money for pocket change. Uh, another way that I made research pay me was uh, I saw an ad on, on, on the paper and it was a Chinese ad. I think Chinese have just, uh, they're taking over um, Africa and they were looking for scientific writers to proofread their work. So essentially they had manuscripts written in Chinese and then they were paraphrased by some Chinese guys. So the English was really bad. And my job was basically, I was paid per page or per number of words to make it into reasonable English. And I did that for a couple of years and it wasn't so bad. So if you find a way to learn research um, or science or publishing or writing, as it's paying you, you're more likely to stick to it. Um, to, I think the other parts of this, of this um, presentation that we, we need to talk about, most of the time, uh, and this will sound pretty, this is what everyone tells you, and it sounds very uh, abstract. You know, you should look for a topic that's feasible, something you can do, it's interesting, it's novel. And there's a lot of writing about this, and it's really not something I want to, 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 to waste a lot of time going through. But I've provided the reference there. Um, I got this from a gentleman um, from India. His name is Ratan and his brothers. Um, and basically what I'd, I'd, I'd want to focus on is that one, you want to think of something interesting. Um, some, sometimes if it's possible, make it novel. So if, if it's been done many times over, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, my, my team and I have published, I think like three, four articles in the past two months, uh, COVID related. And the reason why it was such a nice topic to jump on is because it's novel, right? The other thing is uh, pick something manageable. Uh, I wouldn't advise that you start with a systematic review, start with a case report, something very simple. You know, you saw some guy who had a testicular tumor that was 20 centimeters in diameter. It was removed successfully, he went home, something like that. Talk to the urologist who got it out and then uh, write something up on it. And you don't have to start by submitting it to Lancet or to New England Journal. I've probably submitted it to to New England Journal, I think I've submitted one or two articles. I got rejections uh, from them. So I'm still not at the level where um, everything I send it to New England will be published. So start, start small, start home. And then um, everything you do, let it have a potential value in terms of publishability. So don't do stuff um, if you're not gonna get it published. There's no point of wasting your time. And even in, in as you do uh, your remed things and, and, and I think they've changed a lot since I was here. 
uh, in my time it was just Mzake and that was it, you know, Mzake, everything. Um, publishability is key. So if you're gonna do something and you're not gonna publish it, it's, it's probably doesn't uh, um, make any sense. The steps you want to follow is, as I alluded earlier, you just wanna look for a broad subject, whether it's anatomy, physiology, whatever it is, and then try and do some reading or, around this. You can do a literature review first, it always helps. So that one, you're an authority in the field in terms of the amount of data that you've come through. And even that literature review is often publishable. So you're able to kill two birds with one stone. The third thing is if you are looking for uh, sponsorship, you're probably gonna get it if you, uh, you will get a grant if you've published a review on the article first, right? And then as, as time goes by and as you speak, as you ping it off other people's uh, heads, then you narrow the scope of the focus. Initially, it starts off and you, you are not very clear on what you want to do, but the more you read, the more people you talk to about it, the clearer it becomes. Um, swiftly, I'll move to challenges. I think I have about four or five minutes left. Uh, I think the hardest thing is to begin because uh, most of us, Unfortunately, as humans, we are uh, procrastinators. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the hardest thing is to begin. And I think the duty for you as a team is to push each other to begin. It's even harder when you begin because you realize uh, it's not as easy as you thought it would be. So Brian talked about it and then it sounded really easy and it's not going the way it's going. Then uh, the other thing you think about that you start, you, you start to, to make some progress and then you start having what you call imposter syndrome, starting to think that maybe it's not you, you are not the one who's come up with this and you're not as good. So you start feeling like maybe you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't publish this work, you're probably not that good. So that's gonna come. Then you realize that over time, there's, there's a publish or perish uh, narrative that goes around. So if, if you are not um, publishing, then you probably perish. Then you discover how difficult it is to publish and then you start getting stressed about it. And obviously issues of funding because carrying out research is quite expensive. Um, I want us to look at this, this, it's a tweet. I got it from, uh, from, from Twitter. I can share the, the, the link later. It's, it's a very interesting thread that you probably want to read if you want to go into research or you're doing research. And I just want us to start by looking at it from down here as in this, when uh, Wendelin uh, comments by a GIF, which is someone pouring um, tea into a cup. I think tea is often gossip or some, some hot topic that, uh, that people want to talk about, right? So, um, so, and then I'll just read through it. Like many students, I was told I needed to do research, uh, quote unquote, demonstrate dedication to my chosen field. This is the dumbest thing. Read my personal statement, read my letters of recommendation. If you're not convinced of my dedication, I have no business getting an interview. Uh, then Michael goes on to say, hot take. They don't usually care about the dedication. They care about taking a resident who's going to be productive so that they get more publications with their names on them or minimal expended effort. And they can continue to climb the academic ladders. This is something I've seen myself and experienced. So this is just basically to paint, I'll share the link for this and you can go through the entire string. It's uh, funny, sad, uh, scary, like it will make you feel a couple of things. And it's, it's something that I, I'd, I'd suggest that you read, then you actually feel the, the eventualities or the, the realities of, of doing research and, and the issues that actually you'll come across on the ground. Um, the other thing I thought I would, would share and as I close is um, opportunities for us. Um, one is Annals of African Surgery. I worked there as, as an editorial intern when I was in medical school, I think for three years. Um, so that's, that's, and I think I have guided a few people to join the same program. I think now they're on generation number four, I was generation number one. So the Annals of African Surgery, I've shared the uh, website there. So you can go to the website and keep looking at when they are recruiting interns. So they recruit two interns in, in uh, annually and they'll give them some money every month and they'll teach them how to do research, they'll give them some work. So this is basically a good place to start. So I think I'll share with Nikita or um, Oki or someone uh, when the advert is put out, because I'll probably know. Um, second thing, I came across scientific writer jobs or opportunities and I shared the links there. Uh, the other thing that I've done 
over time and I continue to do is do repertoire for professional organizations. So the only, I put in a few here, I've repertoired for the obstetrics organization in Kenya, the surgical one, the anesthesia one, the urology one. So they often looking for medical students to help with the organization of one, the conferences and some, some uh, scientific um, workshops that they have. So this is a good thing because you often jump in, you get to go for the whole conference free of charge. They house you, they feed you, you learn on the job. And uh, if there was anything to, to be picked up following that, then you probably get, get a job or, or something. So these are things you can do uh, while in school um, as you wait. Uh, these are some of the references that I used uh, and things that you can read. Um, they give you a step-by-step -step, uh, formula of how to come up with a research question. And it's something that I think all of us should do it. I, I can share this and even more resources. So this is something that you probably wanna have. I'll share that presentation so you can also get them. Um, in terms of action plans, I think this is the last thing that I want to talk about. Um, it is very important. And I realize I am one minute to pass my time. It is very important that you make a plan. Uh, and I would like each one of you, wherever you're listening to me from, to, to make um, a plan and start by having an action plan. These are the things I will do uh, by this date, all right? So one, I will identify um, a field or a question of interest. Two, I will read about it. And one should happen by end of the week. Two, I should have um, come together with a few of my friends and started a research group where we'll be brainstorming and this three, I should have already joined um, this online classes or training for the same four. Um, I should probably have contacted someone, a mentor who have been postponing. These are action points and each one of us, I'm sure we have something. If we're here, we obviously, there's an action step that we haven't taken to the next step or that we're procrastinating. I'd like to, to impress upon us to, to make a plan to do that today, today, right after this. Um, I've put my email there and I put my phone number, you can text me um, and I can offer guidance, right? I can help with coming up with a research question, um, formulating it, crystallizing it. Um, I don't know, writing skills, uh, resources, opportunities, anything, right? But don't call, probably text. Right? Don't pick calls off. Uh, this is the last thing. Um, I think we've talked about very serious things uh, past hour. Life is essentially meant to be fairly nice and easy and abundant. I think that's how the Bible envisioned it. That's how nature envisions it. So we shouldn't really make it um, very stressful. So I would just like to urge us to, to um, yeah, do this research thing and do it in a fun way, um, I think. Uh, the last thing is, is uh, me on a motorcycle. I think this was uh, the year 2015. This was motorcycle number two, I think. Number three, actually. Uh, one of my favorite motorcycles. Fun fact, I'm on motorcycle number five now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Brian. Uh, mixed opinions from me also. Uh, I liked, I really liked the analogies and I really liked the uh, inspiring experiences, how you've built yourself, how you've really explored uh, all um, routes and um, alternatives to research, how you really uh, taken things upon yourself and how you've alluded to the fact that um, apart from life just being um, yeah, stale and basic, we should do more to do that. And I'll say that uh, if you're gonna do a research project, just do something you'd love and you want to contribute it in so it wouldn't feel like work and you'll actually, yeah, time will go really quickly. So um, we'll just have a quick icebreaker and Nikita will, um, will spearhead that. Okay, Nikita, you're uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Anna. Okay. Like everyone has heard, you start today. Don't, don't procrastinate anymore. That idea you've had for the longest time, you're at home, <laughs> you're not going for classes, you don't have any excuse, just start some somewhere and um, Brian has shared his contact there are many other people out here willing to hold your hand so in the process and then reach out so uh, for honoring us with your presence and your presentations 
So now we're going to take a break from this very, very serious session and do an icebreaker. Uh, we'll take a few minutes. On your screen, we've projected uh, another Menti program. You log into menti.com on your device, um, use the code 306298 and type in your biggest takeaway from the webinar so far. I can see someone has typed in all caps, action that's now, action. that's true. For me, that's the biggest takeaway. Action plan, start now. <laughs> um, someone else says informative session. Um, it's given them hope. There's uh, guidance available for those who seek it out. Someone again points out that we should stop procrastinating, that's true. Uh, research is essential to advance in your career and address science in general. More non-procrastination points. That doing research is a journey and you have to start from somewhere. So don't feel like you have to eat the whole cake at once. Just start somewhere, but start today. And then in very little time, you'll see that you're not a beginner anymore. You'll have made some progress. Um, someone is complimenting Brian's beautiful motorbike. <laughs> um, dedication starts small. Someone says they can, they, they, they see now that they can also participate in research, even as a medical student. The only responsibility is to start today. Shadow someone in your field of interest. Don't feel discouraged when you're struggling. Yep you can struggle quite a bit. And that's the importance of collaborating with people, not going through the whole process alone. Uh, someone says, great presentation, Dr. Ngure. I'm starting now. <laughs> I like that there was a call to action. So I'm sure we'll see a lot of concept papers coming forth after this session. Informative and interesting. It's hardest to begin, it's true. Beginning is always the hardest step. But once you've started and built that momentum, then you'll get somewhere. Hold each other accountable for their research ideas. Yeah, the, issue, the, the, the concept of collaborating with people. So, so, so keep your comments coming in. We're going to take a few minutes, stand up, stretch, maybe drink some water. And then we'll be back with our next speaker. Emma Aching. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Ngure. Karibu thank sana. you very much. Asante, Asante. We, we appreciate you taking time off your busy schedule to give us no a worries. talk. No worries, no worries. Sour, sour. And thank you very much, Esther. We also appreciate that you have, you know, taken time to talk to us. Asante. In Kenya, we say asante, meaning thank you. Yes. Thank you, Nikita. Um, and as Nikita eloquently said, start in baby steps. And that's not a joke, but babies start off crawling and then they try to walk. And walking seems so difficult at that time. And look at where we, most of our are right now. Um, so get into the strides and just try your best. Um, Never be uh, ashamed of what you think. Try to see whether it's been done before or you can take a different angle. Um, see which discipline you actually like, what questions are not uh, answered well to you in your word rounds or in your class. Uh, it starts from there. And then obviously just keep reading and reading and reading. Uh, I think apart from just memorizing facts, also think about the whys and the hows and what you can do and don't ever think that you're limited. I mean, we people say that we're limited in molecular aspects, but we're, we're coming up and there's always the opportunity of going elsewhere to pursue such studies. Yeah, so um, I hope you're um, all stretched up. I think I'll just uh, continue and I'll present uh, the final and the third speaker. And it's my great honor to actually present uh, Emma Cheng. She's uh, a good friend and a colleague at the International Cancer Institute. And Emma is the research uh, manager at the, at the International Cancer Institute, ICI. 
and she has over 10 years of experience in clinical research management, coordination, program monitoring, management, training, and supervision of clinical staff and community health workers. So she's a nurse and a public uh, health student with an epidemiology major, and her focus has mainly been on community and uh, population-based uh, studies. So from 2010 to actually 2017, uh, which is seven years, she actually worked in a maternal child health project and that was involved, and she was also involved in two National uh, Cancer um, Institute uh, funded uh, clinical trials. And this included one on um, the antenatal corticosteroid trial and the aspirin trial. And in, in her current role, she's very uh, active. She coordinates a sickle cell registry and also coordinates a phase three clinical trial. And in her, and apart from doing that, she's very uh, active in, in, in a multidisciplinary team, which sets up data processes, protocols, and surveys at the ICI. And she's really keen on taking this further and developing better systems for research trials um, and coming up with a good database for cancer and other non-communicable diseases so we can explore. Apart from that, we're also doing a really cool research project with her, which we hope, uh, yeah, finish, like we hope we wind up and sort of start the whole process of data collection. So with that to say, Emma, um, the stage is yours. Um, yeah, go ahead and uh, share your screen if you want to, and you can, uh, I'll just switch off my mic and my video. Hi everyone. Um, thanks, Chana. Those are very kind words. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Emma, we can hear you. We can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Shana. Um, okay. Just one second, I will share my screen. What time do I have to stop? I, I think we are running out of time a bit. I think we sort of, um, yeah, we sort of took too much time on some aspects, okay. but just, um, yeah, take your time. Maybe you have like 20 minutes to wind okay. up and then we can have time to for the question and answer segment. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, and I'm really um, proud of these initiatives to get students thinking about research in their early, um, in their early career paths and um, hoping that this fora and many more that you have will help students to prioritize research for career and even research for, um, you know, like full-time researchers, not like as a part-time thing or a thing that you do when, um, you know, you're sort of out of options. Um, so I feel like my presentation is gonna be a bit more uh, serious. I hope it's not too serious, um, but research and ethics uh, can be fun and, and something very interesting to talk about. Maybe just to, um, again, uh, emphasize uh, about International Cancer Institute. Uh, we are just a year old. We started last year um, around June. And so uh, our mission and vision is to prevent and cure cancer through pioneering interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research. And our key pillars are education and training, um, clinical care, um, research uh, development, and advocacy. Uh, again, big words, uh, but really, uh, we are a team of very passionate um, you know, clinical care research trainers. And we actually got a couple of cool preceptorships going on uh, for training that if you have uh, medical students who are at home, and uh, they would like to join. Uh, Chana, you can, you can share that with them. Uh, let me just um, show my video. Sorry about Definitely. that. Definitely. Um, yep. So yeah, so welcome to take any one of our courses um, that cut across different cancers. So these are my discussion points today. What is research ethics? A bit of historical background. Uh, looking at the fundamental principles, and then informed consent, 
Um, I put the regulatory processes in blue because I, I will just mention them as I talk. And uh, I'm hoping that after this talk, I will get you, um, you guys to think more about uh, research and clinical trials in Africa. Uh, so this first image is uh, from the Washington Post. Uh, it's a recent um, uh, occurrence where we had a French uh, researcher who said um, a few nasty things about uh, um, implementing a clinical trial in Africa. And he raised such, um, you know, um, social media outburst in terms of people were thinking, people started saying things like we're not guinea pigs, um, you know, say no to safe vaccines uh, and, and just uh, got the public looking at clinical trials as something that is done in Africa because uh, people want to dump, um, people want to dump or conduct studies, uh, inhuman studies uh, for proof of concept without, uh, you know, sort of harming uh, those who are not from Africa. And there was even a protest outside Johannesburg to this effect, but social media has so much um, input and stake into people's minds uh, nowadays. And so one of the things that you have to be, um, you know, open about as a scientist is to learn what clinical trials are, what are their processes, and um, how can you educate yourself about the ongoing trials so that you can critically analyze um, an ongoing study and say, I think this is legit. I think this is a trial that would be beneficial to um, the current community. Um, so anyway, Africa CDC went ahead and uh, gave out a statement and uh, they will continue to work closely with WHO to ensure ethically and scientifically sound clinical trials, uh, vaccines and therapies to be tested in Africa. And again, um, using standards and principles uh, that are employed elsewhere in the world. And that's what we want to advocate for as uh, forefront workers in the clinical trial um, domain. Like um, Chana mentioned, I have coordinated two clinical trials in the last 10 years, and they are very rigorous um, processes in setting them up, conducting them, getting outcomes and getting into publications. So it's important that those same rigorous standards that are applied across the world are applied in Africa when we're conducting clinical trials. Um, so I am an advocate uh, pushing more for trials to come to Africa. The map I'm showing you is from clinicaltrials.gov. And this is one body that has um, listed all the clinical trials currently ongoing in the world. And I want you to note that when you look at Africa, the whole of Africa as a continent, um, we have 10,277 uh, trials going on. And when you look at the US as a country, not as a continent, they have 132,000 trials going on. Canada, 21,000. Um, India, which is, uh, you know, in Asia, um, 5,000, that's like half of the trials happening in Africa. And why do we need trials in Africa? Or why are trials important? Because trials uh, ensure that we can produce medicines, devices um, that are suitable for a specific um, population and persons. And many times when you search for literature and you're searching for um, studies done in Africa, <coughs> sorry, um, you will find that many times Black American populations are used as a proxy for the African context. <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So you'll find many times that studies that have been done in the US are used as proxy for the African continent. And this is not always so, especially for us who are now working in cancer and uh, trying to do more studies on um, specific uh, immunogenetic uh, specific treatments for cancer. There's need for 
the African population to participate in studies so that we can use uh, genetic, um, you know, we can collect genetic data that would be appropriate for building care and treatment options um, for the continent. So I'm hoping that uh, if nothing else you remember out of this presentation is that there's need for us to educate ourselves more on trials and uh, create platforms like this to educate more people on the need to have um, trials conducted uh, within Africa. Um, so what is research ethics? Loosely, um, these are norms for conduct, you know, uh, that distinguish between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So <clears throat> when you think about research ethics, um, many times we want to say right or wrong, uh, but really sometimes it's not just uh, right or wrong. Sometimes you have to think outside of the box in um, trying to meet and making sure that all the steps within the research are conducted in a manner that um, does not cause harm, uh, does not disadvantage um, the respondents, and that does not um, you know, focus on science only and forget that there are participants also who uh, need to be carried along um, in the journey. So um, history, I think history is what brought up the whole um, research ethics uh, to the forefront. The picture I'm showing you is a very popular online photo. And uh, the three gentlemen stand, standing, the one in the middle is a, is a German doctor, a scientist known as Karl Brandt. And I don't use this um, to just shame him, but I'm using it to say that I think research and ethics in the, in the current setup, we are all on, you know, uh, standing in the, in the, is it the jury box? Um, that we have to look within us. And even as we conduct studies in campus, are we being uh, rigorous and careful to make sure that whatever uh, protocols, manuscripts we're developing are, uh, you know, taking care of the risk factors, uh, not exposing any participants to undue risk. And so, Whenever the science is exciting, we have to be careful to carry along also the input from the participants. So Karl Brandt, uh, unfortunately, uh, with other many scientists in Germany, conducted studies for the sake of conducting them, exposing Jewish people to um, freezing temperatures, for example, to the malaria parasite. They did mass sterilization. On and on and on the list goes. Many times I do not... Uh, enjoy reading about these stories. Um, we also have other examples apart from that. We have the Tuskegee syphilis study uh, where black Americans were denied treatment for syphilis for many years, even after the treatment was discovered. Um, so this and other examples led to uh, the development um, of codes of conduct when it comes to uh, to ethics in research. Uh, please familiarize yourself, if you're not, with the De Declaration of Hel Helsinki. And this was um, an initiative of the World Medical Association back in 1964 and has been widely adopted um, and again revised several times uh, to establish ethical principles that are now applied to clinical research involving human participants. Also, uh, familiarize yourself with the Code of Federal Regulations um, that uh, like talk about protection of human subjects. And these are also uh, updated regularly um, and they help to govern uh, all federal agencies and all research institutions, including ours um, that implement uh, trials and studies across the world. I would also urge you to, uh, to take good clinical uh, practice courses. An example is the CITI. Uh, I think NIH also offers it. And this will help you to understand to more uh, detail 
uh, what are the core principles that define the responsibilities of uh, the person um, taking place, uh, you know, participating in trials, uh, those who fund it, the sponsors, the investigators, uh, the process of consenting, uh, and even the process of auditoring uh, ongoing trials and uh, procedures to protect human subjects. Uh, so the Belmont report came up with uh, three fundamental principles for research, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. That at any time, if a researcher wants to conduct uh, a study, a trial, um, that people should not be a mere means to an end, you know, that I, I want to know what will happen if you take 10 pills, um, you know, and there's no uh, justifiable scientific question being asked of, uh, of the researcher. So within the confines of scientific work, there has to be science that attaches to, um, uh, to developing uh, specific protocols. And then uh, how do we obtain informed consent from an individual? That is also uh, very well stipulated and that the consent must be voluntary, not coerced. Um, the problem with consenting a lot of times in our African context, it's more, uh, I read through a document in jargon that a participant does not understand or um, a participant is asked to sign something that uh, they really have no um, understanding about. And sometimes uh, because of our context, you find apart from the clinical trial drug, this patient has no access to any other uh, form of treatment. And so the, um, so the participants feels like if I don't join this study, I won't get treatment. And so this and other forms of coercion, uh, we must be careful to take care not to, um, to impose upon potential um, study participants. So participants must always be free to withdraw at any time with no consequences. Their privacy, privacy should be respected and their, um, their confidentiality protected. Uh, Beneficence. Uh, to maximize expected benefits to participants and others and minimize harms as much as possible. Uh, even when you are working with late stage cancer patients and uh, they have you know, been given a, you know, a possible time period um, uh, based on their diagnosis, um, it is still unethical to conduct research because uh, of the assumption that this patient may not have long to live. So we must look at quality of life and quality of care and reduce any psychological or social harms that can be done through studies. We must also ensure that research designs are adequate um, and rigorous. And um, uh, we must be able to derive some benefits from the results. Like I said, not for the sake of it. Justice, um, again, I think this is where the COVID-19 um, a study came up where people wanted, uh, people thought that studies were going to be done in Africa because of, you know, the perception of a lower social economic class, uh, that they had nothing to lose. So anytime a study is conducted, the um, burden must be fairly distributed, that you must uh, pick population from uh, those who are fairly well um, socially able and those who are, um, you know, not and mix it. I also wanted to just look at a few pointers as you develop the informed consent form. And this is a process by which the subject uh, voluntarily confirms his willingness to, to participate in a study. Remember that even if it's a grandmother who's 100 years old, unable to read, she has to understand what you're planning to do. You have to break it down to where they would understand it. And uh, it has to be written, signed, and dated. Some of the components of an informed consent includes um, a statement describing the research, uh, the name, the title, uh, who is the PI, who is funding it, uh, what is the purpose of it, how long is it going to take, what are the procedures and visits, 
uh, what is the responsibility of the participant? Sometimes the participant joins a study, then they realize halfway through, oh, I need to come to the clinic every day. And they say, oh, I had not committed to this. So it's, it's important that the participants understand their role. Uh, what will happen if they withdraw from the study, both from a medical perspective and from a, a legal perspective? Um, a clear statement of what is being uh, experimented, a disclosure of appropriate alternative procedures or course of treatment. What are the possible risks, discomforts or inconveniences? If there are benefits, they must be listed there. And benefits can be anything from transport to an allowance to paying medical cover, all those must be clear. The extent of confidentiality of the study and medical records, if there are any costs to having them participate, um, and if they participate, if there's injury, if there's any compensation for them, um, if they need legal representation um, and the contact details of uh, the investigator, the ethics body that reviewed uh, the protocol, and uh, they also need to know how many other people are participating in that study. Because if it's only one person, then they, you know, they also need to know that if there are seven, if there are 10, if there are 1000. So I also wanted to uh, talk a bit about uh, clinical trials. Uh, I guess this is my forte. And um, those who are not familiar with this website, clinicaltrials.gov, this is where all clinic, ongoing clinical trials are uh, registered online. So if you ever have a question on is this clinical trial legit, then go on the clinicaltrials.gov website and search for it. And it will give you the study title, the status, uh, what disease or condition is being studied, what is the intervention, and where is it being conducted. And you can also, I think, write to um, the investigator or the clinicaltrialgovs.com if you have questions um, or uh, have concerns to raise. Uh, the only difference with clinical trials and other research is that it's mostly an investigation and it can be a clinical, pharmacological, uh, um, uh, in, you know, exam, uh, investigation. And uh, we are trying to discover, you know, if, um, you know, so if does that drug identify any adverse events um, or look at study, the drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, uh, or expression. And also there's uh, the intention to ascertain its safety and efficacy. A child subject uh, or a volunteer or a patient is a person who participates in a clinical trial, either as a recipient of an investigational product or, um, or as a control, if it's a, a randomized trial. An investigational product can be a drug, it can be a biologic, it can be um, a device um, or, uh, yeah, or one of those three. Um, then we also have a principal investigator. This is the lead um, individual who's uh, responsible for the conduct of the clinical trial at the trial site. And the sponsor is usually an individual or a company that takes responsibility for the initiation, the management, or the financing of the trial. Then you have a sponsor investigator. This is an individual, um, you know, he is both the PI uh, and uh, the sponsor in these specific types. Many times you find that these are the, um, uh, the institutional based um, scientists. Then you have an institutional review board or an independent ethics committee. This is a body that reviews all protocols um, and it's independent and it's meant to review um, the whole protocol to ensure protection of um, the rights and safety of the well being uh, of the humans participating in the trial. So they will review it rigorously, um, they will approve and provide comments. And many times um, for clinical trials, they can be quite a bit of a back and forth uh, with the review board. Uh, so then we have industry sponsored trials and we have, um, so these are trials designed and overseen by an organization that develops the investigational plan, selects sites and the investigators and manages the legal and regulatory 
or financial aspects of the trial. So investigator initiated would be initiated by um, the PI. Um, then we have, um, this is my final slide actually. Uh, please remember that ethics covers all aspects of research. Ethics starts when you are developing the proposal um, uh, through the approval process of the proposal when you're implementing the study, the trial, or the clinical trial. Uh, it cuts across study monitoring, and then it cuts across data. We have a lot of ethical issues coming up on data, big data, um, access to data, and uh, who's you know, collecting a lot of data without direct consent. And is it ethical for big companies to use this data uh, without seeking consent? So many times uh, when you participate on a, in a survey online or uh, apps are collecting data in the background of your phone, that's data. So just ethical concerns coming up with that now. During analysis, um, if an investigator uh, decides to withdraw or keep certain data and only analyze portions of it, then there's an ethical concern. Then there's also ethics around publications and authorship. Who takes first authorship? Uh, who can be listed as an author? Um, if a publication has gone out and uh, an author had not been informed, can the publication be put back? And so um, there's a lot to uh, sort of uh, dive into and learn about uh, ethics in research. And I urge you to um, to read widely and 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 um, keep going into um, into trying to understand it as it will affect all your aspects of research. Um, I think that's the end of my presentation. Uh, these are a few references that I have. And uh, this presentation will be available to share with you. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Chana. Well, thank you so much, Emma, uh, for that uh, really insightful and detailed uh, presentation. Um, and I think uh, to the audience, um, apart from just being so enthusiastic on pursuing research projects, always consider um, the value of all life and our environment and always take uh, proper ethical considerations. Otherwise, we will have uh, disasters such as the, the Nazi era and the other disastrous historical events in our life that we're not proud to have as uh, a human species. So um, I'll just hand over to Nikita. Nikita will be, man will be managing the Q&A section. And I hope um, people can, like whatever answers and questions they have, they can still post them on the chat group. Uh, unfortunately, we had a technical uh, problem with the Facebook chat, so um, try to either relate the information to anyone on this Zoom chat to ask the question for you if you're watching it on YouTube. Um, yeah, so, and even if you have problems with that, just forward them to us later and we'll try to send back emails to address them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chana. And thank you very much, Emma, for taking your time to talk to us today. Um, sure, everyone has learned quite a bit. And so we'll kick off the Q&A session with a question I think you'll be best placed to answer. So the questions uh, that people had, had uh, included in their pre-webinar questionnaire, there was a form that we all filled as we were registering to attend this session. Some people had put in their questions, so we'll start with those, and then we'll head over to the chat box in our Zoom. Okay, in our Zoom session, and then we'll also check the, the questions in the YouTube comment section. So the first question we take is: Are there any courses that could help one to build on their research skills? Um, so many of the organizations that have come together today to make this series a success are student-run organizations that provide a conducive environment for acquisition of research skills. Uh, one good example is RIMED, which is a student-run organization based in Kenya. Um, 
maybe the others are uh, the, the, the other organizers will be best placed to talk about their various institutions. But uh, at the beginning of her presentation, Emma mentioned that they have a program. So maybe Emma can take this question, elaborate a bit more about the program that she had mentioned. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so as one of our key focus areas, uh, ICI offers training and uh, education courses. And uh, we've been doing this since we started last year. Um, but COVID period, we've moved a number of the um, courses online. And we, so you can uh, register and take the course. The preceptorship cut across uh, clinical courses and non-clinical courses. Uh, the non-clinical ones include uh, research and biostatistics, uh, data management. Um, and I think we are developing a communications um, course also. Um, so, uh, I think I will share with Chana the application process and then uh, anyone interested can join. The clinical courses are all cancer related. Uh, so we have a breast cancer course, cervical cancer, and they cut across uh, all the way from diagnostics to epidemiology um, to pathology. And we have specialists that are cutting across all, um, all aspects of care uh, as faculty in our, um, in our courses. So I, I know that if you guys are home during COVID and um, you would like to keep engaged, I think this is a platform that you can, you can use to take courses. The courses usually run twice, a, you take a course twice a week for two hours, uh, two hour sessions twice a week. Uh, other than ICI, research courses that you can take, um, I think mostly the prohibiting uh, thing is that you have to pay for it. I think unless you have like institutional, um, you know, if your institutional subscribes to some of the bigger, um, uh, like the CITI training for um, clinical trials, but it has a lot of other courses that are non-clinical trial related. The NIH courses were free for a while, so you can also check their websites. Um, and uh, I, I can work with China to look at other bodies that offer research training that you can you can also join. Uh, yeah, just to add on to what Emma has said, um, I'll I'll just share the the e-learning uh, ICI website uh, link on the chat box. But apart from that, um, you there are several courses which are free. So the new cohort will probably start in August. So you can take uh, courses from lymphomas to uh, yeah breast cancer cervical. The big ones in Africa, um, apart from that, sickle cell anticoagulation, and also the research-oriented um, uh, courses such as data management. You can also learn about biostatistics, which I think is very helpful um, and very um, insightful because if you if you're handling a lot of data, you can actually come up with uh, scientifically solid ways of explaining whether something is valid or has a level of uh, yeah a level of confidence compared to something else which is might have some meat but doesn't have enough so i'll share that um, just right now okay so 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 then the further information will be provided um, through our social media um, maybe through your emails if you're on the farms mailing list on your various whatsapp groups so plus the PowerPoints as well will be shared. Um, so look out for that if you're interested in joining the program. All right, our next question is, how can we medical students with loads of schoolwork to deal with find time for research? So I think that question would have best been answered by Esther or Brian, who have um, taken time out of their academic um, affairs to publish papers. I will remind you so that um, towards the end of the presentation, Dr. Ngure pointed out that you need to protect time for your research agenda. Don't make it an afterthought, do it intentionally. Maybe we can pose that question to Esther. Esther. Are you able to take the question? Okay, um, thank you very much for that question. 
Yes. Um, okay, so as a medical student, we know that our time is very, very limited and um, there's so much to do at every time. But something that I've understood over the years, like from my experience with time management is that if you don't plan, there would always be something to occupy your time. Like, for example, imagine that you're a medical student, you're busy, you wouldn't say you don't have time to eat or you don't have time to sleep or you don't have time to go to church or any of your religious body, like to worship and all of that. So um, if research is something you're very interested in, you can devote like maybe an hour or two in a day to like try to like do something. And it's just like a sacrifice. It's never convenient for you to like do something that would help you or help your society. But it's a sacrifice. It's, you have to give to get. That's something I know. So it's like an opportunity cost. Maybe the time you would have spent surfing on Netflix or trying to relax or all of that. You can give it to research. And over the years, you become like less busy that's something i've known like most of my supervisors research supervisors they tell me that when you become like a doctoral student or you become a professor yourself you would have so many people working with you and helping you out to like make sure that your time is not too like exhausted in the asset and also he said that the thing about teamwork is that you can't do everything and you can give just like Maybe when you're working with a team of five, it means the time you spend as a single also researcher has been divided by five automatically. So it's very, very good to have a team. So that's what I would say. And um, maybe if others have more insight on the question, we can ship it in. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for your answer. So like we've all had, you have to prioritize it. All right, and we can take a question from the audience. Innocent Oduki has his hand raised. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Anita, uh, Nikita. Yes. So I'm Innocent Oduki. I'm the chairperson for FAMSA, the Standing Committee on Professional Exchange. So the, the information that uh, Emma has that has been sensitive, especially in my department. So I was request if Emma can assist us with uh, contact information uh, so that we can uh, be able to reach her out after the session. So if he has maybe an email, a phone number that we can reach out to her kindly, assist us. Thank you so much, uh, Nikita. Okay, sawa sawa. I can see Emma is uh, sharing her screen and uh, putting her contact, typing her contact out. So those who are interested, you can note that down. Thank you for your question, Innocent. Hi, another question. A lot of the questions actually were centered around uh, how the second presentation it was answered adequately. Um, there's a question here about that some of the challenges facing a researcher. So this is open to any of our speakers, Emma or Esther, you're welcome to take the question. I can, I can answer, like, can give my own perspective on the question. So like as a medical student, you would have so much, so much problems, so much challenges, so much obstacle, like in your quest to become a researcher. For example, when I was just starting out, I kind of had issues with scientific writing because for me, I'm more of a creative writer than a scientific writer. And you know, like there's always like a huge disparity between the way those two things work. So I have like, um, the results from a research I conducted, but I can't put it in the Oh my god, that's just there's too much noise in the background. Okay, so I can't put it in. I can't put it in like the best possible way that scientific um scientists would like appreciate. 
So it was. It took me a lot of time. I had to go on Coursera and Skillshare and all of those online um, websites to get um, information on scientific writing. That's one major obstacle you'd face. Number two, you'd have the obstacle of like finance. How would you be able to like afford reagents? How would you be able to like print questionnaires? How would you be able to like do so many of all those things that you need to acquire data? Like, but I just have a belief that if you have a passion and you have a very sound scientific question you are about to answer and you know how to like present your claims to people, to people that are interested in advancing the scientific community, most people would be interested in helping you out. Like for my first um, grant, I just kind of like emailed somebody I know and I was like, I need to do this research right now, I have this pressing question, I can't make me sleep, but I don't have any money because I'm a broke student. And it was like, well, I will connect you to some people and I, you should like prepare a presentation, telling them why this research is very important and all of that. And I did that. And in the space of two weeks, I got funding for that particular research. So there's always, like for most of these obstacles, there's always an answer. There was always a solution, always something that can be done to help you overcome them. And also number three, like there's also this issue of ethics. Like I know, um, I know she took a lot of that part. The third speaker took a lot of the um, thing on ethics. But um, something that I feel like she forgot to say is that sometimes you can be doing like something that is not ethically, uh, ethically sound, but you don't know it because nobody knows all of these things. Nobody knows that. Um, you, you can't tell me that you're like um, an expert on the issue of ethics because there are certain things that to you or to maybe your normal thinking, your ideology, you feel like this is right, but to the scientific community, they would stand at it. So as a young researcher, you'd have those mistakes and sometimes you feel, oh my God, how could I have been so stupid and all of that. Um, you just have to understand that you can't beat yourself up about all those things. Everybody learns and um, it's just a way, like a stepping stone for you to get on to the higher part and all of that. And so, so there are so many challenges and all of that, but I just feel like those three are the main ones that I've experienced myself and I thought to speak on. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you for your answer, Emma. Um, um, my, oh, this is Emma. Oh, sorry. Thank you so for your answer, <laughs> Esther. I was going to say, Emma, do you have anything to add on to the question? The only way to write is to write. That gets me through my struggles to start writing or get into um, creative writing or even just finishing a protocol. So just write, even if it's sketchy, even if it's not uh, completely making sense, and then pass it on. Um, I think Brian had a good advice. Hang around people who are writing, then you're more likely to write um, than those who are not. Hang around people who are doing research, you're more likely to do research. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, that uh, is sort of related to our next question, which is, um, a question about mentorship. So if you give me a moment to find it. Okay, meanwhile, we can move on to the next one, which is uh, the feasibility of publishing a paper as a student. Um, I think as you can see from the, the, the profiles of today's speakers, it's very possible to publish while you're still a student, all the way from first year to the final year of your academic um, curriculum. It's, it's possible. It seems very difficult, but just start, start writing something, start working on your concept, reach out to supportive people, and you'll make some headway. The question was, who can guide you through doing a research for the first time? Uh, so during her presentation, Esther talked about um, meeting a mentor who was instrumental in the process. Uh, so maybe she can kick off this answer. Then uh, Emma can add on to it. Um, 
Um, so first, I just want to say that um, a mentor doesn't always have to be someone higher than you in education or um, like in age, like the way some people think about that mentorship, mentee relationship. It just always has to be someone that is like more experienced than you and has the time to actually mentor you. Like for example, I keep telling people that when they send requests for mentorship to very busy scientists, they are not making the best decisions because those people are too busy with their own personal um, climb to the top that sometimes, most times actually, they don't have as much energy, as much time, as much dedication to like, give to you as a budding researcher. So um, for me, my very first mentor was actually um, someone in my class, not like, he was not a medical student, he, he was in pharmacy. So um, that particular person has published so many papers and I was like, wow, this is the kind of person I want to be as a student. So I reached out to him and he was so helpful because he understood the student life more than any professor could or any like um, doctor already working could. And he was sharing so many things, the things that would make me develop even beyond research. So as a student looking to start something in the research line, you just have to identify those, like your pairs, those in similar, as um, when I say similar level like you, and you just have to reach out to them. And something that is very important because most people always forget, like when you're trying to create a professional relationship, you don't always ask. You should always offer like a way to give back to that mentor. As a mentee, you don't always take. You should also impact your mentor. Like for me, I was like, um, okay, so I'm not very skilled at research but I kind of I'm very very good at writing creative articles if ever you need a poem or something for your birthday or any of those things I would be able to write for you um but please help make me a researcher and that was kind of like for him he said that particular request was amazing because he just showed him that I was not all for the taking but for like a collaboration of some sort so that was something I would advise young researchers always mm -hmm. identify something that you're um, your future mentor might need from, from you and just use that as a line to get him or her to commit to your development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. Emma? <clears throat> um, even if you have not started research right now and uh, the, um, uh, as a medical student, uh, I know that there's a lot to, to do on your plate, especially when you are in school. Um, when you do get the opportunity, maybe internship, post-internship, um, I think identifying, um, you know, a group that is conducting research would be a good place to start. Um, a research working group um, or, uh, you know, a consortium of people who pull together to write, that would be a good place to start. Uh, if you have the opportunity to join webinars, uh, where there are presentations being made on um, your topics of interest, that would also be a good place to start. And uh, seek out um, uh, articles or papers of interest, of subjects of interest. But as an undergraduate, sometimes you you don't really have a favor favor like a favorite area. Um, yeah, so I didn't start as a student. I started after school. And for me, it was more work related. And uh, my mentor was my boss. Um, my earlier mentors are my boss. Uh, my bosses now, many years have passed. Um, but even if you start after school, the thing to do is to be consistent. I know many, um, uh, you know, well accomplished authors who um, started when they got into a project or a program or something like that. Uh, yeah, so I hope that's helpful in terms of um, figuring out, yeah. But the thing is, read more, uh, read a lot of articles in the areas of interest. That usually helps to uh, pique my interest in, in, in what's going on in my areas of focus. And I've been in maternal child health for eight years. I've just transitioned into non-communicable diseases the last two years. So I'm on a learning curve um, and I'm always 
and uh, quick to let people know that uh, I'm open to learning and uh, give me tasks, give me uh, opportunity to show that I have the research skills. I'm just applying them in a different uh, domain of er or area of specialization. Um, so don't be shy also to, to put that information out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you, Esther. As you guys have heard, um, it's not that big of a deal looking for a mentor. Just look around you. I'm sure there are classmates who published a paper or two. I'm sure there are uh, groups of students who've gotten together to you know, give each other the, that momentum to publish papers, do simple studies, desk reviews. They don't have to, to be randomized control trials. And um, keep close to them. Uh, keep asking them how to go about things when you're stuck and you should be all good. Our next question is, what is my role in research as a medical student? I throw that back to the audience. <laughs> Based on the wonderful presentations we've had today, what do you think your role is in research as a medical student? So you can put your comments in the chat box as we move on to the next one. Um, the next question is the ability to conduct medical research an essential skill to possess, especially when applying for a residency program. I would say based on the second presenter's um, presentation, I would say that it gives you an upper hand in your applications, but I, I don't think it's life or death. Maybe Emma can take this question uh, in, in one minute. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. The question was, is the ability to conduct medical research an essential skill to possess, especially when applying for residency programs? No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Because residency is a training uh, period. So your supervisor, your mentor uh, should be open to teaching you um, how to conduct research. Um, but maybe Brian, is Brian on the call? No, but Brian thinking. had to leave. <laughs> ah, okay. Brian had to stop out. But, but he had mentioned in his presentation that it does give you an upper hand when you're, and when you're trying to get into a very competitive program. But I, I don't think that it's a must. It's just, you know, give yourself that edge if you can. Uh, all right. Yeah, plus I'll just add, um, when you're doing your residency, you have to write your thesis at one point to gra graduate. So if you've done research before, it becomes a bit easier to do that. Um, yeah. And even to formulate the idea, it just becomes easier also. And you can also get exposed to many cases and you can just write up uh, on them uh, because you've had that experience in the past. So some of the questions we had um, on the form uh, were on topics that we'll cover in the subsequent series. For instance, this one that asked, how best can we approach statistics and analysis? How can we have a positive attitude towards it? There was another question on how to go about publishing. Uh, yet another on which institutions in Africa, what are the organizations financing research in Africa? So our next session, that will be next week, will be about um, grant application and how to find those financiers who want to support research within Africa. So make sure you come. There are opportunities available for undergraduates. And I think it would be something good to add to your knowledge bank. And now, is it possible to specialize in research after six years of medical school? And is there a program that supports them? Right. So Emma, being in firmly fixed in the field of research, maybe you would want to take that question for us. So are there specific organizations that support research? Sh shall I repeat the question? Yes, please. I don't know if, I if it's my connection or sorry. No, no, it's okay. Is it possible to specialize in research after six years of medical school? And is there a program that supports them? Uh, yes, there's, you can have a master's in, uh, in research purely and even a PhD in research. 
or even in clinical trials management. Uh, so those are two options you can look at. In Africa, now that uh, clinical trials is um, sort of the next big wave coming, we're going to need more um, clinical research associates uh, who would work in diverse geographical areas uh, to supervise, uh, support, monitor, uh, review, um, look into the conduct of clinical studies. So definitely there's a niche uh, for clinical research in the next few years in Africa. And if there's someone interested, um, those are the areas I would look into uh, getting either a master's degree in um, or even a PhD in. So uh, MSc research, MSc clinical trials, um, some courses are combined. Um, I think uh, one of my student, one of my colleagues uh, is currently undertaking a master's in um, like medical statistics. That's also research related and it's open to uh, medics uh, uh, who have an, someone who has an undergraduate in medical, um, in a medical background. Uh, so those are things that you can uh, explore to build your um, capacity in terms of becoming more of a researcher. And uh, there's always the Masters in Public Health uh, that also gives quite a broad scope in terms of epidemiology um, and disease um, in, uh, in the population. Uh, so yeah, so those would be top on my list uh, to explore. All right, thank you. Our next question, uh, recommend an outline for writing the lit review, literature review and discussion. We are going to, our third uh, topic is going to be on the structure of a research proposal. So whoever asked that question, make sure you attend. Then things should be clearer after that. Um, I don't know if people have tried to answer what their role in research is as medical students. Maybe we'll check later. Uh, do we have any questions from the YouTube comment section and from the Zoom chat box? Uh, maybe Chana can... Chana, have you been keeping an eye on the boxes? I have. Uh, I think like the YouTube uh, live just sort of shut off the comment section. so. The only one we would have is the Zoom ones. There was a question earlier asked by Nancy Pachido on the Zoom chat. Maybe I can address it to Esther. Um, Nancy is from JQuad, Kenya, and she was asking what the difference between systemic review and scoping review is. Um, Esther, I don't know if you if you'd be uh, comfortable answering this question, but maybe you can do so briefly. Um, I think I already answered it during my presentation. I said um, scoping review is more, it's just like a buzzword for narrative review. And um, systematic review is, I differentiated it between the two. So uh, most journalists would say um, scoping review, others would say narrative review, why some would say literature review. So it really is just, it's, it's similar, it's just the word that is the difference. Okay. Thank you. Um, maybe we can. On uh, no, there was no. There was a question on YouTube that I saw. So sorry for interrupting you, Chana. It went, okay. "Hello, are the opportunities you listed only in Kenya or everywhere?" That was a question to Dr. Ngure. Maybe you can click the links and see where they lead you. <laughs> um, I myself, I haven't opened the the PowerPoint yet, so I I I don't know. Okay. Um, what we can do is we can, if someone took Dr. Gure's contacts, they can uh, directly text them, uh, text him. And then if you want to talk to Emma further, just email her or uh, text on that number uh, on the screen. Mm. Awesome. I think you had rejected his contact on the screen. Uh, but yes. if someone wanted to contact him and didn't get a chance to see the what was on the screen, then just reach out to any of the organizers and we'll be able to link you up. Otherwise, uh, the rest of the questions here seem like they'll be answered in subsequent webinars. It's been a pleasure mm -hmm. taking the Q&A session. I'll hand the meeting back to Chana, who will then intro introduce our um, the person who will do our vote of thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Nikita. That was amazing from you. So I'll just um, 
end by saying uh, I shared the slides for Emma and Dr. Gure on the chat section of Zoom, so you can download download them directly from that. If you if you if you didn't see them or you don't uh, like you didn't uh, want them initially, I'll still send them on the on the emails uh, registered on the Google Forms. I have those emails, so I'll send you I'll send them uh, both on that uh, platform and. If there's any other questions, we'll have a subsequent webinar with the same sort of survey so you can ask similar questions and questions that weren't addressed uh, in this session, you can even ask them in that session. We'll try to get them answered. Uh, but apart from that, it's been a pleasure. I'm so thankful and grateful to everyone who, in, uh, who uh, joined and I'm just totally blown away and grateful to Esther, Dr. Ngure and Emma, those were those were just brilliant and really um, unique uh, presentations, and I'm so thankful for your time and the preparation behind that. Also, so thankful behind the organizers who've been working really hard. But um, Tony will elaborate that. So Tony is going to just give a vote of thanks, and he's going to allude to those other aspects that I've missed out. So thank you, and see you on the next one. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so this has been a very educative session. Thank you very much, everyone, for the interactive session. My name is Tony Kiprono. I serve at FAMSA, which is the Federation of African Medical Students Association, as the chairman of our standing committee on medical education and research. Yeah, mine will be simple as it stands. I hope that you have got some good insights over the hour and that you have broadened your knowledge base on research, on scientific research. So I hope also our speakers have inspired you and encouraged you to start now. It has been a great honor to have our speakers, to Esther, Dr. Brian and Emma. We thank you for finding time to share with us today. We are grateful. Thank you to Chana for moderating the session. I would also like to acknowledge the organizing committee members. Uh, from RIMED, we have Nikita and Liz. From the Ubongo campaign, we have Koki. From the students, One Health Innovation Club, we have Samantha. From Msake Repub, we have Nicholas Yoko. From SCORI, we have Janet and also Chana. And from myself, from FAMSA, sorry, we, I also appreciate myself and the entire FAMSA Executive Council for the support. To an, an announcement here that we have, our next webinar session will be next week on Thursday, uh, 9th July, and we will be handling a topic on grant application and opportunities for undergraduate students so you will not want to miss that. Our upcoming sessions uh, include, for week three, we have structure of our research proposal. For week four, interdisciplinary research. For week five, we have uh, publishing a paper. Yeah, so basically that's it for the announcements part. We will keep in touch for further communications from our end. Uh, we are coming to an end of the session. Thank you, our dear participants, for attending the session. Importantly, you will not want to miss the updates. So you will also want to follow us uh, on our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For the organizing committee, you can type in the their names and you will you will also find them. Again, we, we will share the their social media platforms in the up upcoming sessions. Uh, for FAMSA, you can get to see what we do as the African medical students through official at official underscore FAMSA through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you would want to get in touch with the organizing committee, you can email us through scoma at famsanet.org. Yes, scoma at farmsternet.org. I will type that in the 
chat box and till there it gives me utmost utmost pleasure to thank you for attending thank you so much to you chana okay bye everyone and take yeah. care of yourselves um we'll see you next week uh we, and we look forward to any other collaborations and any other insight like feel free to contact any of us feel free to be open being open is going to get you to such places and do not hesitate and um i think you can sometimes do things alone so everyone's out there to help you and don't hesitate okay uh, i'll end the meeting now